Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Sir Vince Cable has been part of the political scene for a long time now. He was once a Labour Party member and a friend of Gordon Brown's. He entered government as a Lib Dem in the coalition led by David Cameron, the same one, of course, that brought us austerity. Now he is leader of his party, presiding over the Lib Dem conference taking place in Bournemouth next week. So your first conference as leader, Sir Vince. Mm -hmm. um, nonetheless, your party is in a pretty wretched state. Uh, no, no, I, I, don't, I don't buy the premise. Well, I mean, well hold no, on We, we, we I mean, had an election which we didn't achieve what we hoped to achieve we made. You know, we've got an increased parliamentary party, it's more diverse. Our membership is absolutely at record levels. We've got record numbers of what, people. What happened There's to your a very vote? Positive what happened to your vote? The vote was nothing like as high as it should have been. It went down 7.4%. Indeed, and my job is to build it back up again. And, and I have every confidence in the current political environment that that's what will happen. I mean, you've got the Conservative Party now in a state of complete civil war. You've got the Labour Party in a state of suppressed civil war, and that will break out again once they start deselecting moderate people. And I think people will be looking for a moderate, sort of common sense alternative, and that's what we offer. Uh, nevertheless, your vote has not been this low since 1959, which is a long time ago. It's yeah. the year I was born. That's how long ago it was. You have to find some big new ideas to uh, alert people to your existence, really. You have to get some headlines, you have yeah. to get some coverage. How are you going to do that? Well, I think there's some central issues. One is, of course, Brexit, the you know, big issue of the day. Uh, we're very clear where we stand. We're a pro-Remain party. At the end of the negotiations, we want to give people a choice, the first referendum on the facts, the knowledge of what's going to happen, and give people the choice of you know, sticking with Brexit, if that's what they want, or having an exit from Brexit. That's number one. I think number two is economic competence. I mean, I've been in government for five years. We've got to address these okay. big economic issues around productivity, right. industrial strategy. And third, we've got to address inequality and the massive unfairness, particularly between generations. I want to come those on are to, my big I themes. want to come on to all of those. Let's Let's start with your exit from Brexit. Mm. At the moment, the economy is doing pretty well. Um, there is a clear majority in the House of Commons for Brexit. The Prime Minister got a bigger majority than she expected on the first uh, reading of that bill. Um, and there seems to be no change, really, in the public mood. If anything, the public mood is hardening pro-Brexit. Mm. Where do you expect the change of mood to come from? Well, I wouldn't say the economy is doing pretty well. It's not collapsed. Well, it hasn't collapsed. It's, but it's, we're, we're getting... In, investment is up. Unemployment well, is like, down. Actually, employment is up. Business investment isn't. We've had, the, big, we've had the biggest well. devaluation since the war, the which is, is now feeding Sorry, through into but... higher costs, which is one of the reasons we... It's the cut in real living standards, which is fueling this upsurge of concern about public sector pay. Uh, and we're getting a big exodus of talent. I mean, it's happening every day. I was in my hospital, local hospital, a few weeks ago. Their biggest crisis now is that their European staff, their nurses are walking away. These are real things and they're happening now and we haven't yet left. Across most of the picture, however, the economy is doing quite well. Are you not in the difficult position of being invested in economic failure? No, absolutely not. I mean, there, there are a whole variety of outcomes. You know, it's possible that we could leave, leave the European Union with only a relatively small amount of damage. It's possible. I don't think anybody imagines we could be better off by leaving, but it, they may minimise the damage. But we've seen that the government are completely divided as to whether to pursue this kind of soft Brexit option, and it probably isn't on the table anyway. But there are more extreme options where if we finish up crashing out, which I think is where Boris Johnson and his friends are, the economic damage could be enormous. But that won't have happened, of course, by the time it happens. Mm. Um, we, we go out and then you see what happens. Therefore, I come back to the real question, how can you possibly have an exit from Brexit? In practical terms, I see no way this could possibly happen. Well, the way it would happen is if the, the, the government trusts the people to have a choice on the outcome of their negotiations. We will know in 18 months, two years, much more than we do now about what Brexit actually means so-called hard, so-called soft. I mean, these are big, big differences to whether it's an extreme exit or whether it's more gradual and managed. Give the people a choice about that. An exit from Brexit has got to be the option that remains. 
You have said several times now that you'd like the people to be given another choice, which means a second referendum. First of all, do you accept that for there to be a parliamentary stitch-up of some kind which stopped us leaving the EU would be democratically indefensible? No, I think if you're going to delegitimise the, the public vote, which we've already had, I think we've got to have another one. And I think that simply doing it through Parliament isn't going to be adequate. I'm not a fan of referendums. I was and you, critical of it in the first place. We've gone down that road, and I think that's the, the only way to carry the public is to give them another choice once we've seen what the facts are. So when did you change your mind on the second re referendum issue? Well, I haven't changed my mind. Yes, I you said, have. No, sorry, I, I, I'm so sorry. No, I've I got to read after, what you said. Uh, yes, what I said before was that I think we shouldn't just go back after the second referendum and have another one uh, and, and re-vote. That, I, I, th I, think well, the, I know the quote you're going to produce. I, I, well, I, I have I'm, to read it out. What I'm now talking about is the, the future once we know the facts about exit. OK. Uh, last year, you said the public have voted, and they I have. think it's yeah. seriously disrespectful and politically utterly counterproductive to say, sorry, guys, you got it wrong, yeah. let's try again. But yeah. that is what you are now proposing. No, absolutely not. No, what I said, I totally defend, absolutely right in that context. We'd had a vote. But what is the second a decision referendum had been, except? A, a decision sorry, guys, has been made, again. we're not rerunning it. There's a difference between setting out on a journey, which was what that vote was about, and the destination when you know what's going to happen, when the negotiations are taking place. The, the Prime Minister's produced this rather ludicrous anarchine slogan about Brexit means Brexit. It doesn't. We know that there are massive differences of view. The whole point about Boris Johnson's intervention is that he's got an utterly and completely different view about what Brexit means from the Prime Minister and the rest of the Cabinet. There are different views, um, and once we know what is the outcome, that is the point at which you go back to the public. So I'm not at all embarrassed about what I said. It was absolutely right in the context. We're talking about the future, a first referendum on the facts. But the second referendum is your, in, in your words, sorry guys, let's try again, isn't it? I mean, no, it, no, is about, it is about ending Brexit, otherwise why would you want it? We, would, we want it because we do not you yet know what the outcome mind. will be and we believe the public should have the choice at that point. I, I honestly don't know why people are afraid of doing this. I mean, if, if the people in favour of Brexit well, are so confident of their position, they should be perfectly willing to take me on. Um, the, the real question, of course, is who would possibly call this second referendum? Right. Because the Conservatives won't. I should imagine. Mm -hmm. The Labour Party won't, I'm sure. So who's mm -hmm. going to call it? Well, there are growing numbers of perfectly respectable people in the Labour Party, the Mayor of London, growing numbers of Labour politicians. But they think don't this have is the authority to call a second referendum, it. do they? I suspect that, you know, given this civil war in the Cabinet and the Government, there would be quite a lot of people there who would find this a perfectly sensible way of reconciling the irreconcilable mm. when we get to the end of the negotiation. OK, you mentioned also um, economics and sound economics. Mm. You were part of the austerity government. Uh, Tony Blair said that austerity was the reason that people mm. voted for Brexit in the first place. And I wonder whether you think you're well positioned, as it were, to get younger voters who have become very, very angry, very disillusioned by austerity, have gone over in very large mm. numbers to Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party. How can you be the man to win them back? Well, what you call austerity was the consequences of the collapse of the banking system and the financial crisis. Unsustainable government deficits arose. Whoever was in government was going to have to tackle that problem and do difficult things. I mean, as it happens, my own government department, I was there five years, very big government department, we had to cut our budget by 25%. I know our leap of predecessors were planning to do the same. It was very difficult. I mean, I think I, there are things in government that we should have been doing more of. We should have been doing more public investment. I think we still should be doing that. But so there know, are aspects of that government you regret looking there are, back. There are aspects of economic policy which I argued against internally at the time and I now publicly argued against. But mm. the basic thrust of it which was to put the economy on its feet after the financial crisis and provide stability, which it did, getting the economy back to economic growth, which it did, getting us back to full employment, which it did. I mean, those, are, those, are, those were positive things. The other thing that your department did, of course, was that it tripled tuition mm. fees. Mm. Now, you've got a new policy on tuition fees, I think, coming up. Can you explain to us exactly what you propose? Well, I think the starting point is that, you know, my party and all parties have actually let down students. I mean, we made a pledge seven years ago about not increasing them. We, we went back on it. We lost a lot of support as a result. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn's just made a pledge on wiping out student debt, had to admit they couldn't Wasn't do it. It wasn't a pledge, it. actually, to be uh, fair. Tories have been through the same journey. We're all, we're all in a, in, not in a good place on this issue. But what I've been doing in my year of exile, uh, I worked with the National Union of Students on how we can 
address the problems of all young people, not just the 40% who go to university with funding. Uh, I'm now asking senior former colleague David Howarth to have a fresh look at how you deal with the student tuition fee issue. The basic principle that Mr. we have at the moment... You want graduate tax, is that right? Well, that's certainly a, a, a good option, because what happens at the moment is, we, effectively, we have a graduate tax. People pay 9p in the pound above 21,000 income when they're graduates, but of course people think of it as a debt. And it would make sense, I think, to, to rationalise that. But I'm, I'm looking at all a, the options. more than a rebranding of the current system? Well, the basic principles of the current system have something to commend them, which is, first of all, that um, you don't have to pay. I mean, it's not a contractual debt. You only pay if you're a high-earning graduate, above mm. 21,000. I think that threshold should have been lifted. Universities are properly funded. It's one of the few bits of the broader public sector, which is, you know, has got a decent amount of money and, is, and can improve standards. And any alternative, including what I believe the Chancellor is proposing, has to meet that test. I mean, how do you get money to run a world-class university system? I teased you gently at the beginning of the mm. programme about your assertion that you might be the next Prime Minister. How would that possibly happen? I think it's perfectly plausible, actually. Take us through as, it. As leader, as leader of the third UK party, my job is to be the alternative Prime Minister. I think British politics is in a remarkable state of flux. I mean, you've got the Conservative Party now in open civil war, complete breakdown of discipline. You've got the Labour Party in a suppressed civil war. I mean, they've, they've had a good election, and Jeremy Corbyn's currently riding high. But we know under the surface there is enormous so, discontent about the extreme left. I'm, I and my party are the alternative. So you seriously think you can go from a party that's getting 7% of the votes to a party that wins an overall majority in a couple of years? It's possible that it's we, very, could break, we could break through. If, if British party politics starts to break up, if the traditional structures start to break up, they could well happen. We're extremely mm. well positioned with moderate, sensible policies, a good track record of government. We have government experience, good experience at local government level. Okay. Uh, I think what you may find is that there is a big shift of opinion in our direction. So I'm very confident talking and about being an alternative Prime Minister. Do you think what's happened over the last day or two with the Boris Johnson intervention, which is a very, very robust, very positive, optimistic view of Britain after Brexit, um, is that the beginning of a breakup of this cabinet? It's a, it's a terrible situation, and it puts Theresa May in an impossible position. I mean, I just don't understand why he, she hasn't fired him. I mean, it's like a school that's completely out of control, and the head teacher sitting in her office, paralysed and impotent. And if you're Mr Barnier negotiating with this government, and you've got senior cabinet ministers with entirely opposite views of what Britain's negotiating position should be, I mean, what do you do? I mean, it is complete and absolute loss of authority. And the, the Prime Minister on Monday morning should fire this guy, otherwise her own credibility right. is reduced to zero. Sir Vince Cable, pungent as ever, thank you very thank you. much indeed.